James Grind, thank you for speaking with us today. We really appreciate your talking with us. Tell me a little bit about where you're originally from. My understanding is that you come from a pretty big Catholic family. I come from a very large Catholic family. I'm one of seven kids. I'm number six. <clears throat> I was uh, born in New Jersey and uh, lived in a small town right out, right across the, the, uh, the George Washington Bridge. And we went to church every single week. Every kid went to Catholic school. They went to Catholic colleges. And it was, uh, it was made that way from uh, generations before I was even raised. So you were in San Francisco. How did you end up in New York? So, the so the, here it is, is that my father uh, was offered a position in San Francisco. So in 1971, uh, we moved from New Jersey to San Francisco. And uh, there I was uh, uh, enrolled in a public school for a couple for a year and a half, and then I went on to a, uh, a private high school. All the kids had to go to uh, Catholic school. My father was uh, adamant about that. He didn't believe that the, uh, the, the standard public schools were going to teach us moral teaching. So how important was your faith to you growing up as, as a child, as a young person? Well, I saw my mother and father being very holy and understanding that. And uh, as a kid, you want to be your dad. And you really want to, you want to go forward with all that. So I had a lot of trust in that. And I wanted to be, uh, it was important for me to be, become part of the church. I was an altar boy, I was a lector, and later on in life I became a Eucharistic minister. So it's always been there. It's always been important. Jesus Christ has always been important to me. There were times when I, I lost some of that. But, uh, and we can talk about that. Um, so tell me then, so then when you were in, before you moved to San Francisco, did you have a regular church that you guys attended there? Yeah, uh, was it, it was, uh, yes, it was Mount Carmel. That's Mount Carmel in Tenafly, New Jersey. Okay, very good. And that's where I was uh, baptized. And I was baptized by uh, Theodore McCarrick. Okay, gotcha. So then in that sense, you were baptized by him. So was he a family friend? Did, was he, you know, everybody know him, parents, you know, your siblings, everything? He was uh, my Uncle Werner's uh, best friend in high school and in college. And he brought him home, McCarrick home, to his mother and father's house in Teaneck, New Jersey, where my grandfather endeared him and loved him and treated him like his own son and uh, paid for everything all his education, every place he went. When the family went on vacations, he went with them. He bought him his first car, so he was part of the very fabric of my family. And so when he came to visit us, whether it was in New Jersey or in California, it was important that he was there because the priest is here. The holy man is here, and we all have awe towards him. He was you know, our, 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 our path to Christ. And he, my father said, you must obey him. So in that sense, a lot of trust was placed in this man around you and your siblings, even when the other adults weren't around. Absolutely. We had to call him Uncle Teddy. We did. We believed him that he was, he was just on the exact same tier, tier, tier as my, uh, my Uncle Werner, my Uncle Bob, my Uncle David. They were, he was Uncle Ted, and Ted, and that's what I had to call him. And uh, it wasn't so much that he was a priest, but he was just, he was my uncle. And so he's part of the family. And in my family, we talked to each other, and we talked about feelings in our family. And uh, I was supposed to talk to him about my feelings. And uh, it was very, very important. He was a very important person in my life. Did you openly talk to him about your feelings? Always. It was like easier than going to the confessional box and saying something through the, through the screen. I was able to sit across from him and talk to him and give him, show him my body, uh, body language and really get to the depth of what was going on because I trusted him more than I ever trust anybody because I knew he wasn't going to turn around and go tell my father about all the stupid things I've done. And so I was able to get, tell him things I couldn't tell anybody else in the world. Um, I know there's 
a lot of details that you can't say, but tell me what you can. Uh, I think you told me that there was a, a key date, 1969, when the abuse started. What can you tell me, if anything? Really nothing at this time because the, there's an active investigation at all levels of the church right now. And uh, I'll just tell you that 1969 was a horrific situation and it continued for 18 years. I didn't see him every day, but every day I saw him, he abused me. So he completely shattered your trust, what you had before, 1969. I was, yes, I was alone absolutely alone with my own thoughts. A very sad place to go for anybody. What did you say to yourself in those times when you were alone? That I must hide what is happening to me. I cannot tell anybody and I have to protect myself from anybody else, because if this man's doing it to me, how many others are going to do this to me if I open my mouth? And I cut myself off from God, from other human beings, and got lost. Did it eat away at you over time? I mean, just... eat away is as a calm way of putting it. <clears throat> I told myself lies when you're by yourself and you're cut off from God and you have no new thoughts. You tell yourself lies that you're not good enough. You tell yourself lies that maybe you're better off not being on the earth today. And the noise in the head was tremendous. And there was only one way to really turn off the, wall, the noise, and that was to self-medicate. When I drank my first beer when I was 13 years old, the noise went away. So I chased that beer for the next 20, 18 years. Who, who did you tell about the beer? How did you get access to it? I stole it. Stole it from neighbors. Stole it from my father's liquor cabinet. Any way I can. When you're in need of something and you have an obsession and a mental compulsion to go get it, you do. You do anything you possibly can to get that because that's the only thing that's on your mind. Because everything else that's in your mind is noise and it's loud and it stinks. So I had to squash that feeling. Did you ever break down in front of your siblings or your parents and, and just say what was going on or anything? I tried at one point to tell my father. My father is a very holy man. He was, ra he was born in, in 1918. He was raised in a way where the Catholic Church was supposed to be the Holy Church and those men were good men and that he had a belief in God that was unshakable. So when I go to tell him that I am being abused by the church, he could not put his arms around it. He just couldn't. And I don't blame him. He sent me to my room to go think about what I just said to him. That was 13 years of age. I was then absolutely alone. That's what I meant by being alone before. And booze became the replacement for Jesus Christ. Um, how, how long did you go not praying, being cut off from God? It started at 13. How long were you like that? Until 33. There were days I went to church because you have to go on Christmas and Easter. 
And there were days that I would go to church with McCarrick because I was going to visit him. But my real faith in God was gone. And it wasn't coming back. Did you hear at any time from, from any, anyone else the same kind of problems, any other priests that were abusing other people um, during any of those years, the, the 20 years? Was there anybody who could relate to what you were going through? I heard some stories, and that's all I can say. But I didn't relate it to me because neither one of us could say anything. What changed? What happened that happened at 33 that got you back on a better path than where you were? I'm there right now. I did a really good job of trying to commit suicide. <clears throat> I asked God to take me. I was hoping beyond hope that I was gonna die. I couldn't take it anymore. I slept for 36 hours and I woke up. I wanted to do it again because it didn't work the first time. And just as I was doing that again, I had not answered a phone, not walked out of my house in many days. I had not answered a phone in six months. My phone rang, I answered it, no. God did. The person on the other end of the phone sent people to my house. It seemed like before I even got the phone back in the cradle, there were men bashing through my front door. I went to uh, an emergency room. And they talked, they, they said to me that uh, they had somebody for me to talk to. And uh, I was afraid, but I did. The person on the other end of the phone said, 10 years ago, I did the exact same thing you did tonight. And today, I live happy, joyous, and free. That was God. There's been a lot of God movements around those times. That was 1991. On November 21st, 1991, I stopped drinking. I stopped doing drugs. And I let God back in my life. And since then, I've not seen or felt any reason for me to ever go back there again. As they said to me, in many places I've gone, I never have to feel like that again. And I don't ever want to feel that again. There must be temptations though, right? I mean, right after you gave everything up, was there ever a point where you felt just I know for so many people who give up alcohol, <coughs> give up drugs, it's so difficult um, because the temptations there, were you ever tempted to go back or revert? Of course. Of course you are. But it's a cross. It's a chance. I'm always reminded I'm hanging around with people who are not drinking. 
I'm hanging around with people who have holier lives. They have, a, they have the widest eyeballs I've ever seen in my entire life, and I wanted that. I wanted what they had, so I did what they did. I followed them. I had some guys in the very beginning of my recovery that were tremendously strong. My best friends had 5, 10, 15, 20, 40 years of, of not drinking. That was powerful for me. I wanted that. I wanted that. So I, I jumped into my recovery with both hands and jumped into the pool. And, and sure, I was swimming in the deep end for a while, and I wasn't sure what was going on. But I started to remember the faith I had as a child, the faith I had in my father. And I went back to that and found it. I went back to the Catholic Church for a while, realized it's not for me. And I just needed to pray to Jesus every day. My friends in recovery were telling me that I should start to pray every single day because he need, you need God to return your, your sanity. You need to ask him to erase your brain so you can get back to being the boy that you were before it all started. <clears throat> so I ask him for that every day. I also turn my life and my will over to the care of God every day. And I've been doing that for almost 1,300 days in a row. And I assume your advice to be for other people out there to do the same thing. Yes. God wants us to be alive so he can use us for his voice. I am his instrument. It was shame on me for trying to destroy God's work. I no longer have the shame. I have a purpose, and one of my purposes is to be here with you, look in your eyeballs, and talk to you about this. Remind me, just for informational purposes, James, when you went to the emergency room, what city were you living at? Where were you at the time? <clears throat> I was in Arlington, Massachusetts. And you were there working, I assume, job? Yes, I was, I was working in, uh, in high tech, yes. okay. a very successful high tech uh, business. And remind me, the, the things that you did to yourself that night to try to commit suicide, was it drugs specifically or was it something, certain specific kind of substance that you did? I had a uh, uh, chronic back problem. When I was a child, I bent over backwards when the back of my head hit my, hit my heels. I was given prescription drugs a lot, and I had a, I had a pretty good supply of it. Mm -hmm. I so, took many Percocets and a half a gallon of gin. Um, tell me, once you went into recovery and started talking with these people and you had friends around you, um, how much of a relief did that feel to, towards your life? And when you think about the years after you were 33 and began to recover, uh, just tell me how important it was to have them around and, and to have more stability as opposed to what it was before. When you're in your own life, telling yourself and you're cut off from God and you're cut off from other human beings and you have your own thoughts, you have the same thoughts over and over again and they're all lies. And I've been telling myself these lies from age 13 to 33. And, it, and it's, I'm getting sick and tired of it. So how important was it for no, new people to be in my life? 100% important because they had different thoughts. They had new thoughts, things that I had never heard of before or had heard of before so that I could possibly get, out of the, the, get off the merry-go-round that I was in of all the garbage that was in my head and find out what is real and what is not real and, and to move forward. So when I first went into recovery, they suggested to me that I not move back to where I used to live, 
and to move to a different part of town so that I didn't know where the bars were, I didn't know where the, where the, uh, where the stores were, and I didn't know anybody there. I had to start all over again. And thank God I listened to that. And thank God there was a space for me in that home. How, how do you think Theodore McCarrick groomed you or put you in a position where you were? Well, it's, it's very important that uh, he had the trust of my family. And so that I, had a tr uh, I then was trying to be able to transfer it over to him to give him as much trust as possible. Little did I know that he was really grooming me to become his little boy. I didn't know that at the time. It felt good to get, get uh, comfortable with this man, to be open, honest, and real with him at all times. He wanted me to become part of him. He wanted me to endear him. And it was important for him to do that to me so that I would always think of him first when I had a problem in my head. I didn't think about my father. I didn't think of anybody else. I thought of him. I didn't think of maybe going to, going to uh, a priest, a different priest, or doing anything else. At one point in my life, I said to him that I had gone to confession, and he, he, he yelled at me, because you don't need to tell anybody else. I'm the only person you need to tell. I am your pathway to Christ. So I was yelled at and kind of said, okay, well, I will, I will believe you and I will go with you. And so I was able to go to confession every time I saw him. And I, I was able to tell him my deep, dark secrets. And he was grooming me to do that because even in the last moments where I wanted to die, I needed to tell him what I was doing so that he could possibly help me. That's how much he controlled my mind. So when I say he abused me for 18 years, how could that possibly happen when he brainwashes you to believe that he's the only one it happens? When did it stop? When did he stop abusing you? And why do you think it stopped? I, it stopped when I got sober, when I stopped drinking, and I woke up from this horrible dream, this horrible life, and I ran from him, ran away as fast as I can. Any time that he was coming near, I refused. My brothers and sisters wanted me to ask him to come to different family functions. I never called him. Sorry, he never answers his phone is what I'm telling my brothers and sisters. I never called him. I didn't want him there. Once I saw him at a, at a, at a parish in Maryland, I told my sister I was sick and I needed to go out to the car. I just don't feel well. So I left Mass. I couldn't be in the same room as he. Was there any thought after you got sober, after, after you had uh, friends around you, and after the age of 33, uh, where you said initially, maybe I should go to the police, you know, once you started getting sober, thinking to yourself, what had happened to me needs to be reported. There were some gentlemen in my life that, when I was in early recovery, who suggested this to me. And I had talked to them about a lot of things, and they said, you need some serious mental help. You can't do this by yourself anymore. The pain was too great. I had written down everything that had happened to me. And I said that to another human being. And I decided at that time in my life that the person who listened to me had a hard time understanding it, understanding the depth that I was talking about. It wasn't my time yet. I waited. 
this is big. It's bigger than I am. Is that why you're speaking out now about it? I mean, is it time? Do you feel like it's just, it, it's important for you to come forward, part of God's will? I mean, why is that now? God is raising saints all over the world. There are new saints coming out and speaking. It's our time. When I read about the art in the article, my, my sibling sent me that article about the altar boy in New York. I thank God that day. I got down on my knees. It took me two days to get off my knees. And I got to talk to other siblings. And I just to see whether they were going to believe me. And then they did. And then I was able to tell more people. And they believed me. And they wanted to help me. And they told me they needed, you need to, uh, you need to go see us. You need to get some medication for yourself because your brain's going to blow up. And people listened for the first time. It was a gift from God. He made saints. He has continually made saints. All of us who speak about the abuse in the Catholic Church and the cover-up and the sadness of everything that's, being, that's happening out there, our time is now. And saints are being raised every single day. My biggest saint, is big enough. When I read his letters, I know the jig's up. We are going to rise up now. It's all going down. Does it surprise you that the Viganos cast aside that some people say don't believe him. No. I was cast aside. Don't believe him. They can't handle their own truth. They don't want the world to find out that they're fake. What happened to me when I started to get abused was I cut off Jesus Christ. I cut off God. There were no new thoughts in my head. I believe the same thing happens to abusers. The same thing, they had the exact same thoughts. They're premeditating, they're figuring it out. They're going around in circles trying to figure out how am I gonna get the next person? They're not being priests, they're not doing that. They cut themselves off. I lived it. It's a sad place to be. So, by the grace of God, I have a moment of clarity at 33, and now at age 60, I have another moment of clarity. That it is my turn to come and speak so that the world can be freed of all this evil. The moral teaching starts in the church. 50 years ago, they stopped teaching Jesus' word. What do you think about Theodore McCarrick as a man. How do you describe him? He's a sad, weak man who has lost his faith in Jesus Christ. I pray for him every day so that he may feel the need to repent, to just tell the truth, to come back out from behind that collar and realize he's just a fallible man as I am. It, it's incredible to think after all of this that Theodore McCarrick, even though he's been stripped of the title of cardinal, he's still an archbishop 
and is now living in Kansas. Do you think he should be removed from the priesthood? What else do you think should happen to him that, quite frankly, hasn't? He needs to become... He needs to be removed from the priesthood. He needs to be taken to a place where he can see the damage that he has done. The Catholic Church needs to stop the silence. And they all need to repent. They need to talk about us. They tell us to repent our sins to them. It's their time to repent their sins to the world. How disappointed were you, if that's the right word, but how did you feel when the bishops this week, you know, couldn't, vote on anything, didn't vote on anything substantial about bishop accountability on the sex abuse crisis, on anything uh, because of requests by the Vatican. They, the bishops, are not obeying Jesus Christ. They are obeying Pope Francis. They believe that Pope Francis is the person they need to talk to, that they need to, to respect, and that he is the church. The bishops did what they're supposed to do and be obedient to Francis, to the Pope. That's what they signed up for. And as a priest, you're supposed to be obedient to, to your bishop. In the Bible, it doesn't have that. In the Bible, it says you were obedient to Jesus. We don't need bishops. We don't need priests to teach us how. We just be obedient to Jesus Christ. And I'm obedient to Jesus Christ. They failed this week. In my eyes, they failed. But in their eyes, they did not because they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do according to their own beliefs in being obedient to Francis. And as I said on Tuesday, it's not Francis's church. It's Jesus Christ's church. And of course, all of the bishops, big bishops from around the world will meet with Pope Francis on this in February for a big meeting about it in Rome. Do you have any sense of any optimistic feeling that things can change, or do you think that this is basically, it's gonna be the same old message? I don't know what exactly happens. I can't predict that. I have faith that something will change because between now and February, many new saints will come to be and they will be louder and stronger and tower over all these bishops and tower over the, the Pope in Rome. And we will be stronger and we will take and realize that Jesus is doing for us today which those men cannot do for themselves. It's that large, it's that large. There are saints coming that are going to blow every saint that's ever been on the earth before away. We're going to be very big and we're going to be very strong. And it's going to be great. It may happen in February, but it will happen. What's your message to Catholics out there who see this in the United States and around the world? How should they pray? What should they do when they see and hear your story and the story of others? Um, what do you think regular Catholics in the pews can do try to help or to try to change things? I'm a conservative Catholic. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Ten Commandments. I lived a pious life sometimes. I'm not perfect. We must pray that no saints come forward. We must pray that 
Jesus' word is passed on to others. The church is in a very difficult situation. The men in the church are the ones who are running it. But the church is Jesus Christ. Always stay faithful to Jesus Christ. We're going to go all the way to the end. And it's not going to be pretty. There's going to be more problems. I've talked to every AG in the nation. I've talked to senators. I've talked to lay people. And new things are going to happen. It may not happen inside the church. It may take the U.S. government, the most powerful government in the world, to put a stop to this. And it's not going to be pretty. There are so many, so many new states that are happening right now that are opening up investigations. I mean, the federal government said, don't destroy anything, gentlemen, because we're coming to get it all. And it's not just the abuse, the sexual abuse or the clericalism, it's the money laundering. We have to ask God to ask the bishops to stop praying for false gods. They have idols that they go for. And money is their number one idol. And that is a breaking of a commandment. James, that concludes all of the questions that I wanted to ask you. If there's anything else that you would like to say, um, we're, we're happy to hear it, or any other message that you'd like to, to send or anything else, we're open. It's important for me to be able to speak through your station, to reach more people than I can as I walk through the world. We have a new power to reach more and more people all over the world. They need to realize that Jesus Christ is doing for us right now that we couldn't do for ourselves. For years, we asked God for an easier, softer way. I know I did. That stopped for me on November 21st, 1991 and it became hard. And we must fast, and we must pray, and we must meditate, we must talk to other human beings, we must let new light into our heads every single day, and we must forgive the bishops and the pope, for they don't know what they're doing. Thank you. James, thank you so much for talking with us today. You're I know welcome. That it takes a lot of courage to be able to speak about the things that you did. Um, and I know that these are thoughts that you've been reflecting on for a while. Yes. And so uh, I know a lot of people also appreciate the fact that you've come forward and have been open and honest with us today. Excellent. Thank you, Wyatt.